That is, that is a fantastic ministry, by the way. Thank you for coming and sharing today, Lola. I appreciate you coming. Um, that's, that really is an awesome place uh, here, here in Newport that, that really makes a big difference. It makes a big impact. And it. it's an awesome thing that we um, are able to support it. Um, that's awesome that uh, Maxine uh, was able to be there and be part of the foundation. And we have a, a church member who um, was such an integral part in starting that. So um, that's very cool. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk, uh, I want to continue our, our, our talk about um, Jesus. We've been looking at Jesus a lot this year. We've looked at the first year of his ministry. We looked at the second year of his ministry. We just finished almost a month of the third year uh, of his ministry. And I kind of want to keep that going, if that's all right. Um, and I want to look today at a really neat uh, passage of Jesus' teaching. And it's a passage where he he spoke about being a shepherd. And this idea of a shepherd is a, is a pretty common one in the Bible. It's one we see fairly often uh, ascribed to both God and Jesus. Uh, it's, it's one that we see and we hear about. It's one that the people of the time would have understood very well. A uh, shepherd was, was someone that they recognized. It was a very common job in those days. It was, it was very normal. It was a hard job. But it was a job that they would have all recognized. They would have known. They would have understood what was going on. And when that comparison was made, it would have registered in their minds. It would have made sense. I mean, look even back in the Old Testament, right? And David, the 23rd Psalm, one of the most famous psalms in all of the Bible, one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible, the Lord is my shepherd. Talking about a shepherd and, and calling God his, his shepherd, his, his caretaker, his provider. And we see Jesus over and over, he talks about himself very often as a shepherd. It's a very, very common illustration. And I want to look at that today. We're going to be in the book of, of John, chapter 10. And Jesus is going to be talking uh, about himself as the shepherd. And he's talking specifically here to the Pharisees. And as we know in his third ministry, as Jesus got into the third year of his ministry, this is the time when his favor had kind of reached his peak and was almost on the downturn. People were, were turning away from him a little bit more. And the Pharisees were coming after him a little bit harder, and he was standing up to the Pharisees a little bit stronger. There's more tension going on. Jesus isn't quite seen as this wonderful, overwhelmingly positive guy in everyone's minds. And so as he's teaching, he's teaching a lot more pointedly. And that's what he does here. Uh, John chapter 10, starting in verse 1, he says... Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Therefore, they will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And so Jesus starts out very strongly here against the Pharisees, right? And he's talking about shepherds versus thieves. And he makes this comparison. And he starts talking about the thief, right? And we know a thief. The thief comes up. And he wants to steal the sheep. He doesn't come in through the entrance to the gate. The entrance to the gate is guarded. It's protected. And so he climbs over the fence to get into the sheep. And when he goes after the sheep, the, the, the thief doesn't call to the sheep. It doesn't make any sense for him to call to the sheep because the sheep don't recognize his voice. In fact, the sheep, when they don't recognize someone's voice, they run away. They're chickens. They're scaredy cats. 
because they don't recognize the voice. They run away. They, they try to escape from the thief. And though this thief comes in only to try to steal the sheep, he comes in in a sneaky, sneaky, underhanded way. And the thing about the thief is the reason he comes in is very different than the reason that the shepherd watches the sheep. A thief comes in, he says, to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the thief is all about. When a thief comes in and breaks in and tries to steal sheep, he doesn't come in and go, I'm going to give these sheep a better home. I want to take care of them. I really was love these sheep so much, I have to have them for myself. That's not his purpose. He comes in to steal and to kill and destroy. He steals sheep so he can turn around and sell them to somebody else and make some money. Personal profit. He comes in to, to kill a sheep and eat it to fill his own belly. Personal gain. He's just trying to fill his own belly or to destroy. Sometimes a thief breaks in for no other reason than to cause destruction. He doesn't care about the sheep, but he has something against the master of the sheep. He wants to attack the master through something that's precious to him. And that's what thieves care about. The thief isn't about the sheep. The thief is about himself and what benefits him. But you see, a shepherd is different. The shepherd has very different motives. Not only different motives, he has different processes. A shepherd comes to a gate. And a lot of times in or near a city, they would have a big fenced area. And all of the shepherds in the area would put their sheep in together. And the sheep would get all mixed together. They'd run around. But the shepherd would come in. The gatekeeper would open the gate. The shepherd would go in and he'd call to his sheep. And in the midst of this big herd, this big mass of sheep, certain sheep recognized the voice. And their heads would raise and they would all start coming towards the gate because they recognized their master. They knew, that's my shepherd. That's the one I'm supposed to follow. And they follow the shepherd, and the shepherd leads them out. And the shepherd, it says in the passage, he leads his sheep. And the reason the shepherd did that was because he wanted to go first to watch out for any dangers. Dangers in the, in the terrain. It was very rugged, rocky, difficult terrain. He wanted to watch for dangers in the terrain. He wanted to look out. Maybe he knew a place where he wanted to take the, the sheep to find grass and water. They were difficult resources to find. So he would lead them to where they needed to go. He'd watch out for, for enemies, for thieves, for, for uh, animals trying to come kill the sheep. And so he'd lead his sheep. And a shepherd would carry, as he led, he would carry his tools with him. He'd usually have a pouch over his shoulder. He'd carry some light food some nourishment for himself. And he'd carry his sling. We all know about the sling from David and Goliath, right? We, we know about the sling, but usually we think of the sling normally as a weapon. And it could be used for a weapon. It wasn't really the primary weapon of shepherds. In fact, the sling primarily was used as a guidance tool. And what the shepherd would do, they were so accurate with this sling that as they were leading their sheep, they could look back. They didn't have sheep dogs. It's just one person out here watching a big herd of sheep. They put a stone, and they could sling the stone one side or the other to kind of startle the sheep back to joining the rest of the flock. And they could, they could aim so precisely that they could hit a certain spot, and the sheep would kind of run back away from that rock that had landed. And they used the, the sling as really more of a guide more often than a weapon. Their main weapon was what they called the rod. My rod and, my, your, rod and your staff, they come for me. The rod was this club, basically. A big, heavy club. Sometimes they put nails or something sharp in the end. And if, a, if an enemy would come, if an animal, a lion, would come and try to attack the sheep, they would use this club as a defensive weapon to try to protect their sheep, to try to fight for their sheep. And then he had his staff. We always think of the staff. That's the big, long one with the arch in the end, right? That they could use to reach down in holes and pick the sheep up and pull the sheep back from danger. As the shepherd would go out and he would lead his sheep and he would protect his sheep and the shepherd cared about those sheep. That was the difference between the shepherd and the thief. The thief was only in it for himself. He was only in it for personal gain. But the shepherd cared about the sheep. They were valuable to him. They were precious 
to him. In fact, this, this knowing his voice thing, this was the result of years of time spent with these sheep. Years of trust being built up. You see, sheep weren't used for meat very often back then. They were more often used for wool. And so you didn't transition through sheep all the time. You would have the same herd of sheep for many years. And those sheep and the shepherd were building a relationship. And the shepherd knew his sheep. He would understand them. He had names for them. He knew their tendencies. He knew their personality. And they knew his voice. They knew that they could trust that voice. They knew that that voice belonged to someone who cared for them, who would protect them, who would rescue them from danger, who would fight wild beasts for them. They knew that. They knew that they could trust him. Because the shepherd cares about his sheep. He's there to protect his sheep. And so Jesus, he's, he's talking here, and he's talking about the shepherd versus the thief, and then he moves on to talking about the shepherd versus the hired hand. Because sometimes the shepherd was usually the owner of the sheep, but sometimes the owner of the sheep would, would hire someone else to take care of them. In verse 11, he goes on, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And so we see here the, the difference between a shepherd and a hired hand. And a hired hand's not a bad person. They're not, they're not trying to steal the sheep. They're, they have nothing against the sheep. They're not, they're not trying to ruin the shepherd's life by attacking his sheep. They're, they're in it only for the money, really. Again, it's, it's somewhat personal game. It's, it's honest personal game. It's for a good reason. But it's still really for personal gain. And when you, when you aren't invested in the sheep, when you see a band of thieves coming to steal your sheep, you're a lot less likely to fight, aren't you? If you don't care as much about the sheep, when a lion comes along, you're really going to sit there in your mind and debate, is it really worth getting into this, or should I just let him have a sheep or two? Protect my own neck. Because here's the thing, is the shepherd is really, really involved with sheep. He cares about the sheep. They are precious to him. And not just a little bit, not just because of the benefit he can get from them, but the sheep really were valuable to a shepherd. In fact, I was thinking this week about value and risk, right? And I was thinking about if my house, I was thinking this week, if I was sitting or standing in my front yard and my house is on fire, my house is burning, it's a blaze, there's fire everywhere, it's very dangerous. What would, what would cause me to risk going back into that house? But I go, man, I really, I've got, I've got some stuff in there that's worth some money. I don't want to lose that. You go back into your house for something that's valuable? I, I wouldn't. You're not going to go back in your house because something cost you a bunch of money, right? I got a car in the garage. I'm not going to go, well, I got to try to back the van out of the garage real quick and save it. No. That can be replaced. That's not that big of a deal. Barely. Barely. I go, what about, what about my pillow? I gotta, I, my pillow's comfortable. It's like conformed to my head. It's hard to find a good. I'm getting old. You can tell you're getting old when you bring your pillow when you travel, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen, that's right. That's, that's one of the signs, I think, of getting old. Is, is, there's a few other ones that I'm hitting there, too. But that's one of them. And, and I, bring, I like to bring my pillow. It's comfortable. I sleep better. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. It's just right. It supports my neck real good. I wouldn't go in that house for a pillow. I wouldn't run into a burning house. And yeah, it's a good pillow, but it's not worth risking my own life. For that pillow. What about what about family pictures? And those are memories, aren't they? Those are sped. I mean, I've got four kids. I've got pictures of, of my kids and, and ultrasound pictures and, and, and pictures of them growing up and, and they're when they're first born. And 
I've got videos of different things that my kids have done. I've got pictures of our wedding and great memories. I wouldn't risk my life for those pictures. As, as special as they are, as, as wonderful as they are, as much as they mean to me, I wouldn't risk my life for those pictures. But if my kids were in that house, if my kids were in their bedrooms and they were trapped and the house is ablaze and I'm standing out front, there wouldn't be a moment's hesitation. I would be in that front door doing whatever I could to get them out. I would be more than willing to trade my own life for my kids' lives. In fact, if you're a parent, I, my guess is you're probably in the same that boat right now as me. Because that's worth it. That's a trade worth making. And when I read Jesus talking about a shepherd and how a shepherd faces thieves and faces wild animals and is willing to lay down his life to protect the sheep, it's because he thinks the sheep are valuable. It's because the sheep are worth a lot to him. They're precious. It's not just about money at that point. It's about something that really has worth to him. You see, a shepherd values the sheep so much more than a hired hand. A hired hand's just there to do a job. But a shepherd is there taking care of something that he values. That Jesus is like a shepherd. I love that illustration. There's this idea of care and nurture and prizing the sheep. Treating them so well. Having this relationship with the sheep. It's a special thing. It's a, it's a wonderful illustration. And you can see not only because the people would have understood it, but also because of how well it applies. You can see why that illustration got used over and over of Jesus or of God as a shepherd. And he ends up this passage by talking about a shepherd a little bit more. And he even transitions to talking about himself specifically a little bit more. And in, cha in chapter 10, still starting in verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. That's the third time he's used that phrase. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command... I received from my father. And I see really three things in this little section that, that, I, that I want to talk about, about this, this shepherd. And the first is that phrase, the good shepherd. And when, when a lot of times when we think of good, we think of morally excellent. Right? We think of something that good means you're, you're morally right. It's, it's a good moral person. It's a good moral thing. It's something that's, that's good. But in, in, in this passage here, the word that's used there isn't a word that you would use like that. It's a different word. It's a word that, that actually almost talks about something being good to the point of, of being beautiful. It's beyond just a, a moral goodness to something even greater. Picture in your mind a small town with a doctor. And this doctor is a person who not only is known for being good at practicing medicine, but he's a doctor who's built a relationship with the citizens of the town. He's someone who, who's willing to get up and to go to somebody's house because they're too sick to visit his office. He's someone who's, who's been driving past and seen Farmer Bob struggling with his tractor in the, in the field, and he pulls off and goes out and helps Farmer Bob because he cares about the people in his community. He goes above and beyond. It's this, this word that brings to mind this image of, of someone who's, who's not just good morally, but, but beyond that, takes it to the next level. You call that the good doctor, right? A good, oh, the good doctor. Someone who, who is beyond just good at their profession. Someone who's just moral, but something even 
greater. And when Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, that's what he's saying. Not just good, not just moral, not just, just good at being a shepherd. It's beyond that. There's something greater than that. There's more to this relationship. There's excellence there. There's greatness there. And he is the good shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd, and a few verses later, he says that there are other sheep not of this flock. What does that mean? Other sheep not of this flock. And I've heard, I've heard some different theories on that. But we have to remember that at this time, when Jesus was around on this earth, the Gentiles had not been accepted yet. Jesus was still only speaking to Jews. It wasn't until he, he rose again and up into heaven after his death and resurrection that, that really the Gentiles became accepted. And yet, even here, he's laying the foundation. He's not, he's not specifically mentioning, he's not talking about it, but he's laying the foundation for people to accept Gentiles in the future. To say, I as the shepherd am not just here for one group. I'm here for more beyond that. I'm here for others. And he's preaching in such a way, he's teaching so that hopefully people will accept this other group, these Gentiles, which I'm so thankful that we are accepted. And then he gets down to the end and he starts talking very specifically about his death because you see, as a shepherd, Jesus wasn't just willing to die for his sheep. He did die for his sheep. And, and he, he didn't die because he was backed into a corner and there was no other way out. He died because he chose it. He knew that was the way to save his sheep. He knew that was what was right. And he chose it. He, it was his own choice that allowed it to happen. And he did it knowing ahead of time. This isn't right before his death. He knew ahead of time what was coming. He knew his purpose. He knew why he was coming. He knew it was going to happen. And he was still willing to die. And not only was he aware of that, but he even is aware that he was going to come back to life. He knew the whole plan. He understood the plan, and he was willing to go through it. It was his choice. It was his decision. And he went through it for his sheep. So I look at this whole passage, and I, and I have two kind of thoughts based on this whole passage about Jesus and the sheep. And I love this passage. And there's kind of an external thinking thought that I want to leave you with, and kind of an internal thought. And, and in each of those thoughts, there's a few thoughts. <laughs> You've got to put on your thinking hat today, I guess. Here's, here's my external thought today. I've done a lot of preaching about Jesus this year. Talked about Jesus a lot. I've we looked at a lot of stories about Jesus. We looked at several teachings from Jesus. When I look at this, this passage about Jesus as the Good Shepherd, I see some things that we've really talked about a lot this year. And it's not because I've specifically cho chosen passages that align with these things, it's because these are things that Jesus cared about. And number one, I see that Jesus died for everybody, that he chose to die for everybody. Not just for a select group of people, not just for a few of us, but he chose to die for everybody. It was his choice. He understood what he was getting into. He didn't do it for just a few people, but he chose specifically to die for all people. We have the choice to accept it or not, but he chose to die for all people. I think that's a, a powerful, powerful truth, and we've talked about it a lot this year, but I think it's important to always talk about it. This is an essential part of our teaching, is that Jesus died for all people on purpose. That was his choice. The second thing, it kind of ties with that, and it's that he cares for all people. He loves all people. And the third thing, he even aligns with that, and it's the fact that he desires us to care about all people. And those are kind of three things I think we've seen. You know, just about every passage that I've talked about in Jesus this whole year, we're coming up, this is our fourth month talking about Jesus, 
And in all of these times, over and over and over again, every passage we've looked at has had at least one of those elements, I feel like. And some of them, like this one, has had all three. And it's the fact that Jesus died for everybody. The reason he died for everybody is because he cares for everybody. And because of that, as our shepherd, as our leader, as our example, he asks us to care about everybody. Which means showing them love. Which means showing them mercy. Which means showing them his message. We're, we're sheep, we're protected, we're his flock. And our desire should be to have a big flock. Our desire should be to have more people where we're at. It's important. Our desire should be to show love to those that our shepherd loves so much. And so that's the external side, right? That, that's us looking out at the world. What, what, what should what should we be thinking? When we think about the world and we think about Jesus as the shepherd, my hope is that you will see a world that Jesus died for. That you'll see a world that Jesus cares for. That you see a world that Jesus is saying, I want these people in my flock. And you're the rescue plan. You're the ones who I ask to bring people to that flock. And now for the internal side. For the, for the kind of the us side of this. When I think about the shepherd, that's a, that's a beautiful illustration. I think about the relationship with the shepherd and the sheep, and I think about a shepherd who cares for his sheep. And we talk about Jesus caring about us a lot, but do we really stop and process that? How much he cares for us? To the point where he guides us, he leads us to nourishment, spiritual nourishment, and ultimately, he not only was willing, but he did give his life for us. He died for us, each one of us. He cares about you, and, and I don't know where you're at. In fact, I, I think back to the 23rd Psalm with David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he meets our needs. It leads me in green pastures. It leads me beside quiet waters. And I, I think about these beautiful places. And here's David. He's, he's writing this passage. And when we struggle and when we hurt, it's important to remember that we have a shepherd who's there. When we're going through stuff, we're talking about prayer requests in class this morning, all the different things. And we have some big stuff going on in our lives right now. And it's hard to go through stuff in life. And it's difficult. And yet, even when things are hard, even when it's helpful to have other people or hurtful because we don't feel like we have other people, and we still have that shepherd. We still have God caring for us. He still loves us. He's still there. He still died for us. He values you to the point of death. You were inside of a burning building and Jesus was out on the front lawn looking in and there wasn't a moment of hesitation. It was his choice to run into that house and trade himself for you. The good shepherd, not just the shepherd, the good shepherd. The shepherd who cares. The shepherd who, who loves. I know a lot of people in this room have been going through it lately. I've got a lot of stuff hitting a lot of people lately. And I wish that I wish that I could take it away. I wish I knew some perfect way to make things easy. I don't have a solution. But I know who's in control. And I know who cares about each one of you greater than anybody else. And it's the Good Shepherd. It's Christ who came down to this earth, who walked, who healed, who taught, and who ultimately chose to give himself, to die a horrible death for us. And after three days rose again, and 
all this power. He proved I, I have authority over death. And who's right now is waiting in heaven, who's preparing a place, ready to come back someday. And as hard as life is, how comforting it is to know about the good shepherd. 